what a wonderful season the month of December is for our hearts as believers. This month, I, I want us to truly uh, to worship. Uh, what a great song to start, uh, to come up here to preach to you directly following after. Uh, great singing as well. You know, when I was an unbeliever, uh, Christmas really didn't start until sometime around December 24th. Apart from a little bit of decorating and some present buying, everything else, it kind of held off as far as a recognition of Christmas, a celebration of Christmas until uh, right around December 24th. However, as a believer, I've begun to realize, especially in ministry, Christmas kind of starts as soon as Thanksgiving ends. Uh, you know, last night we, we had a, a wonderful celebration with our three T's. I'm so thankful for our three T's, the, the tried, tested, and true uh, group of our, of our older generation that is here at CBC. Just what a wonderful testimony and sweet grace they are to us. And also so thankful, uh, especially for Carl and Cherry, putting that together last night. Just a wonderful time of, of being together with the body and uh, fellowship and, and, and many other things. So thankful for the month of December, for everything that it brings together in it. But at the forefront, uh, the reason for the thankfulness and, and what I want to focus on, especially in our time of teaching, is to understand what should be an almost sense of awe to, to think through what it means that, that our Lord, we celebrate the first Advent of Jesus Christ. Even as Bill referenced that we are those who are in between the Advents. We are those who are in between the coming of Christ. We, we have the, the first coming which was spoken of and established and promised having been accomplished. And then we have the second coming which is spoken of and promised still yet to look forward to. And so I want this season to be a time of, of being in awe that God became man that he dwelt among us, that he truly brought forth his righteousness in provenness, and taking that righteousness imputed to us at the cross, his righteousness that we could be restored in relationship to our creator. It's an amazing truth that I think it's overshadowed too easily. And so when I think through those things, we're going to spend the next four weeks doing just that. As we worship in song, and our fellowship increasing as it always does during the season. There's, there's a list of get-togethers and caroling and, and multiple other things that are specifically unique to the month of December. And of course, through a study of God's Word. As we do so, I want to consider the birth through some of the participants' perspective we are given in the Scripture. Each week we'll be looking at a unique individual or group spoken of in the Bible's Christmas account. Now one of the things I think of when I think of Christmas and, and the church and being gathered together for a corporate time of worship on a Sunday morning or on the Lord's Day gathering, and when I think through that, I, I think one of the, the things that you should do or should expect when you come to church is that you should expect there to be truth, right? I mean, that, that's a simple expectation. Scripture gives that to us. It says in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3 that the church is in fact to be the pillar and the buttress of the truth. And with that, we know that there's a lot that happens at Christmas that, well, it's not truth. As a matter of fact, it's even what we would call fantasy. Much of the Christmas celebration has been overshadowed by fantasy about a man in a red suit who flies with deer and comes down your chimney. Now, I know that that's a tradition that we may hold to some degree, as deer, and it's not, I don't, I want to be clear in this, it's not wrong to have a celebration of family and the giving of presents, to have a Christmas tree in your home and to do traditional things, but when we gather here together on a Sunday morning, I, I want us to gather around truth. I don't want to deal in fantasy. I, I don't want to deal in that which is false. And so you'll hear it in our music very specifically as we sing about the truth of the birth of Christ and what that means to our world and all the fullness of that, and you'll hear it in the teaching. This church should be a place where truth is upheld. You should come here expecting to hear the truth. Now, as much as we might recognize the, the fantasies of Santa or other elements of Christmas, my greater concern as we gather is 
that we understand the truth about what really the birth of our Lord means. About what that truly means in so many ways. And so this morning we're going to be studying lessons learned from the Magi. Or you might know them as the wise men. Or we've been told they're three kings of the Orient or multiple other things. And so I want, to, I want to walk through that because I think that the wise men has kind of become a little bit of a fantasy here at Christmas. I see a different uh, nativity scenes that display the wise men in the nativity scene. What's the problem with that? The wise men weren't there. They weren't there at the nativity. They, they weren't there when Christ was in the manger. We see in the text that they came to the house. They came after the fact of the birth of Christ. And, and we recognize other elements as well that I think they're things that we've grown up believing or having been told or just have never had clarity in. And I want to walk through those things to understand more. There's so much about Christmas, biblical truths about Christmas that have become uh, cards, Christmas cards. That we know more about Jesus' birth from what we read in the Christmas cards we receive oftentimes than what we know from the account given to us. So if you would, we've been studying through the book of Matthew. We've already got to chapter 8, but we're going to go backwards to chapter 2. If you would turn there with me, it's in the book of Matthew that we have this account of the wise men or the magi who came to worship King Jesus. And I want to read that account together, beginning in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejo rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, there's a lot happening in this section that we just read. And there's so much that we can recognize in Herod's response and the response of Jerusalem. And we can see that they had a place to go and seek out where was this child born. We can see the prophecy of God being displayed in this text. There's so much happening. But what I want to simply focus on this morning is these three wise men or these three magi who came to worship the king. And with that, there's, there's three things I think we can glean or learn this morning from them. Three things that should affect our faith and faithfulness today. When I think of them, I oftentimes think, growing up, hearing the Christmas story from a biblical or Christian perspective, I don't think I ever really knew who and what were the Magi. H have you ever thought about that? Were they three kings from the Orient? Were they, were they three wise men? Was there really even three of them? Because we're not told that in Scripture. It is spoken of in the plural sense, so we know there were at least two. But we don't know if there were two or ten. We have no idea. We know there were three gifts, but that doesn't mean there were only three gift givers or that there were even three gift givers. And so I think I've, I've grown up with a mindset towards this as the Christmas story. It's like the Easter story. You know, we have, we have the rabbit, and we have the eggs, and we have all the family gatherings and all that. And on the side of that, 
we also have this recognition of the resurrection of Christ. And when I showed up at church, there would be specific things being done, and we would talk about the empty tomb, and it, it would be a special season to some degree of recognizing some biblical truths. But I don't think I ever understood to depth some of the things that were given. Why, why is this account in our scripture? Why is it only in Matthew? Why, why is the account of the Magi coming contained? Why do these 12 verses contain that for us? Because we believe that all of Scripture is God-breathed, therefore all of Scripture has purpose and goodness for us. So why is this account given to us? Who and what were the Magi? And I'm afraid that, that when we think about this, so much of Scripture has become a footnote. And it should not be. So much of Scripture is something that we kind of just skip past. Oh, I know all about the three wise men. I'll just skip these 12 verses or read them quickly and move on to something that I didn't know about or something more important. And that shouldn't be. Everything in Scripture has a purpose. Everything in Scripture has meaning. Consider the genealogies. I've so enjoyed a study of the genealogies. I know, when you get to that portion, all the elders ask me, please don't give me the genealogies for the reading. Right? They're not the easiest, and oftentimes it can become a little bit boring of so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so begot so-and-so, but they have very specific purpose and goodness. When we studied through Matthew chapter 1, we had to begin with the genealogy and seeing the purpose in it. Think about it in this way. If you don't see the fullness of God's plan being carried out in sinful or fleshly human beings then how can you recognize confidence in your own life as a sinful or fleshly human being? In other words, oftentimes what we see is God's control over history displayed so beautifully and clearly in the genealogies accomplishing exactly what he promised in spite of the shortcomings and failures of those contained in the genealogies. Giving us the fullness of God's plan over time which should give us as believers or those who have faith in God the confidence for his plan in the present times we face. I think we all recognize to some degree the, the, the amazing nature and the degree and scope of God's plan revealed in the prophecies which have been fulfilled. I mean, it's fascinating that you can read in the book of Micah that when Herod sought the leaders of Jerusalem and said, where is this child, this Messiah, to be born? They said, well, in Bethlehem. Because several hundred years before the Magi ever showed up and dropped this bombshell on Herod's door, it had already been told that it was going to happen. And so we can recognize there's an element where the prophecies concerning Christ give us a picture of the scope and fullness of God's plan for our confidence. Did you know that there are some 300 plus prophecies fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ? 300 plus accounts given in God's word very specifically about where he would be born, how he would be born, how he would die, what would come forth from that, specifically giving a picture of the life and ministry he would live, 300 plus that are recorded prior to any of them being accomplished. And so there are some very specific ones about his birth, the location, the purpose, and other things. But what I want us to see is that these things are given for a purpose. They're not just something that makes us stop and say, wow, and then we leave unmarked by it, but rather there should be something being accomplished as we recognize these truths about our God. For example, that when God says to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled, you've believed in God, believe also in me. When he tells us in Scripture that we are those who are to be anxious for nothing, but we are to by all things through prayer and supplication bring our needs to God. Have you ever thought, what's the foundation for you being able to do that? That's not simply, as we saw in our, in our study of thankfulness, it's not simply a command that we're obligated, don't be anxious, therefore we recognize it's sinful when we're anxious and we have to fight against that. No, it's much more than that. Because of the faithfulness of God and our faith in Him, we are freed up to be those who are anxious and nothing. And we've been given a means by which to carry that fight against anxiety or anxiousness out by going to the Lord, the faithful one who holds history in his hands and has made promises for all of future. 
that we can recognize those things and, and walk through that. How about this one? To know that whatever you are facing, our God is sufficient to meet that need. That's a promise and a provision of our God. To know without equivocation that he is working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose that love him. How about this one? That we are as his people to be those who walk by faith in him and not by the sights of the moments of our lives that we are facing at any given time. You know, oftentimes you've heard said from this pulpit that, that faith in God is not a blind faith. We are not to be those who, who walk blindly by faith. Yes, faith is something hoped in that has not yet been fully received because it does require you trusting without seeing the future. However, it's not blind because our God has laid such a foundation in the past that you can look back even as you walk forward by faith. You see, this is the picture that we're given in Scripture, and we cling to these things. These are amazing commands and amazing promises that we all know. We know that God commands us to not be anxious in anything, but in all things, to by supplication and prayer, make these requests known to God. We, if you've been uh, in church for any length of time, you've heard that God works all things together for good. We know that, that Jesus says that we're not to worry about tomorrow. You know the truths, but I think sometimes we miss the gift in passages like Matthew 2, 1 through 12, that are truly the foundation for those truths carried out in our lives. You see, the account of the, the Magi lends itself to the truth of who God is to the truth of our faith in Him, that we can foundationally look back so that we can walk faithfully forward. It's such a beautiful picture. Consider some of the historical background, and there's limitless resources on this. Hey, there's a, an article from Answers in Genesis that deals specifically with understanding more fully who they were and where they came from. There are multiple resources. I can't list all of them. and there's a, This comes from a smattering of all of them. But I didn't know this until uh, when I studied this in Matthew 2, about a year and a half ago. But the term magi is, is really not a word. It's not a word that's been translated. It's not a translation of a Greek word. But rather, it's a name for a tribe or a group of people. That they were known, this was a specific group of people, such as the tribe of Levi, were Levites, and the tribe of Benjamin, and those things. In that same sense, this was not a Jewish tribe, but rather a Gentile group of people, the Magi. Hey, this group is mentioned several times throughout the pages of Scripture. And while it's limited, it's not spoken of at great depth, there's still quite a bit we can glean. Hey, there's a rather full picture to be seen through the pages of Scripture about understanding who were these Magi that came seeking the King who was born that we celebrate at Christmas. The first thing we recognize, they were quite powerful and influential. They were quite powerful and influential throughout the pages of history. We can trace them back to the time of Hammurabi. During the times of the, the Medes and the Persians and others, and they established the law that, that ruled the land of that time. That no king was able to be king who had not studied and shown himself excellent in these laws that were established by the Magi. They were known historically, one of the ways in which they were called is they were called kingmakers. Because no person could be king without the assent and approval of the magi of that culture and time. And so, when I walk back through that, we, we see that throughout history, both biblical and secular, there are multiple accounts of the magi and the work that they were accomplishing and the stature that they held. But it often crossed my mind, why were a group of Gentile wise men looking for a Jewish king? Why is that coming into the account here? Why do we have in Matthew 2 this picture of, of this group of, of magi who aren't really overly spoken of in Scripture? And when they are spoken of, it's in a passing reference of them fulfilling this role or that role in the, in the culture of that time. And suddenly we come to Matthew 2 and they, they play a prominent role in the birth of 
Christ in the season after his birth? Well, there's a very easy answer. It's a biblical, historical answer. And I think it gives us such a clear picture. You may recognize it. Daniel. Daniel. You know, Daniel in the lion's den. It, you hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were in the fiery furnace. These are accounts that we grow up with as children. If you went to vacation Bible school or you attended church as a child, you've heard of Daniel. You've heard these accounts. But do you know the fullness of, of what was being accomplished through all of this? When, when you look back into the Old Testament at the, at the account of Daniel, you have this amazing picture and I don't have time to go through all of it this morning, but let me just refresh it in case you're not familiar with it. There was a king in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, by God's divine sovereignty, was brought forth or bringing forth judgment. When you read in the book of Habakkuk, in Habakkuk we have the prophet Habakkuk crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, how long will you allow your people to live in rebellion against you? And the Lord says, oh, I'm going to do something. I'm going to raise up those Chaldeans, that fierce people, and they're going to bring judgment against my people. Well, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, they were the same. And so in that, we also have the account of who? Jeremiah. Jeremiah saying, this is what's coming. Repent, turn from your ways, O Israel, for what has been promised is about to come. Then we have Jeremiah writing also in the book of Lamentations describing what happened when Babylon made war against Judah, against Israel and the, and the Hebrew people and devastated them. And through that devastation, they took captive some of the young men from the Hebrew children. And they brought them into captivity in Babylon. And you know the account. As they came in, they, they said to the one who was there in charge over them, we don't want to defile ourselves in opposition to the Lord. We, we don't want to eat things that we have been commanded not to eat. Test us in this. You know all of the accounts leading up to this. And you remember what happened. That Daniel rose in stature because God gave him specific ability in the interpretation of dreams. That Daniel, through the ability to interpret the dream of the king, rose in great stature and favor to a position of great prominence in the Babylonian Empire. And as we see that, he became what? I don't know if you remember this. In Daniel chapter 5, as he's looking back at one of the sons of Nebuchadnezzar and looking back on all that had been accomplished through Nebuchadnezzar, he's recounting his story. And what we see in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 11, he says, There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, listen to this, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. Daniel was appointed leader or chief over the magi. You see, that's where we get the term magician. It comes from that root word, magi. We get magic or magician from that. And so, consider this picture that's given to us in Daniel. You didn't know it wasn't just about lions in a den, did you? It's an amazing picture of God's sovereignty over the control of history in such a way that leads perfectly to every plan that he's put in place. So, we see the Babylonian Empire captures these men. God raises this man, Daniel, to prominence through the giving of the ability to interpret the dream of the king, which none of the other magi of Babylon could do. Through that, he was given a position of leadership over them. In that position, he was taught. We know that they were taught and had to learn some of the culture of Babylon. As a matter of fact, the fullness of what Babylon was accomplishing is not only did they try and wipe out the Hebrew people, they also tried to wipe out their culture in entirety, making those whom they captured become Babylonian in every sense of their thinking. And so in that position, Daniel was being taught, but something more than that. As the leader over them, he was teaching them. Daniel was teaching the Magi of the time of King Nebuchadnezzar the truths of the promises of God that were given to the Israelites. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, we have an account where he's prophesying, Daniel's speaking of the coming Messiah. Now, it's clear. I have no doubt that Matthew 2 gives us great clarity that this group 
was influenced by these truths. That there was a passing on of the truth of the Messiah. The truth of the belief of Israel in preparation for these kings to come. For these wise men, these magi to come. Have you ever considered some of the prophecy? And how many times do you read the New Testament? If you're studying through God's word, you'll see at times it says, And this was done, or this was accomplished, why? So that God's word might be fulfilled. That that which God had spoken of in the past would come to pass. That prophecy would truly be fulfilled. There's a prophecy that was given specifically that says there will be great mourning from the mothers of Jerusalem in the time of the birth. And we know what? You know the account. So the Magi came, having been prepared several hundred years before, by this man Daniel being risen to a place of prominence over them that he would influence and teach them about the Messiah having been promised to the world through the people of Israel, that on this day they would come bringing news to Herod that the prophecy of God about the mourning and the lamenting that would be heard in the time of Israel and that out of Egypt he would call his son as they had to flee there specifically to escape what we know Herod did ordering the death of every male child under the age of two and down and so there was great mourning and they fled to Egypt and out of Egypt he called the son and all of this was put in place by God through Daniel in the lives of the Magi several hundred years prior so that when Matthew 2 comes to bear, the fullness of God will be fulfilled. Nothing is apart from his purposes. Nothing misses that. And more than that, there seems to be a measure as this group came. And they came before Jesus. It says they worshipped him. They worshipped him. Even as a child, they came to worship him. And so, what we need to understand, the first thing, is that the account of the Magi traveling to and worshiping Jesus was recorded with the purpose of giving us a glimpse again of the fullness and perfection of our God's purpose and plan. You see, if you can't look back and see that, then you will live in anxiousness and fear looking forward. If you can't look back on the proven faithfulness of our God, then you can't stand today on the promises of our God. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you will be dealing with, as John Nelson tells us continually, everybody gets their turn. And that is true. In different seasons, in different times, in different ways, in different measures, but we all get our turn. And so recognizing this, isn't it exciting? I hope that you're being brought to a point of excitement to recognize how God controls history, to see the faithfulness of God throughout the pages of history in every minute detail from hundreds of years prior in preparation for the fullness of his promises to be carried out so that you today with whatever you're facing or tomorrow with whatever you will be facing that you didn't even know about today, you can walk by faith. That you can face it without anxiousness or fear. Because you know that you know. Not, not that you believe. As we looked at last week, beliefs can be affected by pain and suffering. Beliefs can be shifted, but that what you know is untouchable. And you need to know about the faithfulness of your God in every minute detail of history and future. Or else you will struggle greatly in whatever the weeks, days, hours, possibly the present time you're in holds for you. Isn't it exciting? This account of the, the magic, this is so much better than a Christmas card. Hey, this is so much better than, than seeing it displayed on, on, a, on, a, on someone's front lawn. There's nothing wrong with that, but isn't this better to see the biblical fullness of what was given to us? It's not just something that we, we sing in a song that we recognize. It's a truth of Scripture about the faithfulness of our God that allows us to stand on the promises of our God. Because if our God is not faithful, then what do we have to stand on? We're not called to blind faith. If he wanted us to have blind faith, he'd have given us John 3.16 and told us to figure the rest out. 
He gave us all of this so that we might know him in the fullness of who he is, that we might trust him, that we might walk by faith standing on the provision and promises that are proven by our God. And it's not wrong to say that. Did you know that Paul said that the resurrection of Christ was the proof of all of the promises he had made before? Hey, there's a measure whereby our God is continually proving himself because he knows that we're fickle people. He knows that we're in a fallen world. He knows that we are subject to fallen flesh. And he knows that we all get our turn. And he doesn't want us. He's made provision for us in, in simple accounts like the Magi. That we can walk through the times of trouble, the seasons of trial, even to the degree of a point of joyfulness. As we're told in James 1, we as God's people are able to do. Because we recognize that even our times of trial are working something great. Paul could say, I consider the sufferings of this present time. And Paul suffered when Paul spoke of sufferings, he wasn't speaking hypothetically. Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present time as nothing compared to what? The promises of God that I by faith look forward to. He had not yet received them, but he looked forward to them by faith, standing on the provenness of God in history and in his own life. So recognize, isn't it exciting? History is his story. His story is what history is, and God controls it. Long ago, before the foundation of the world, he picked out a man named Daniel. In the fullness of his preparation, he put him in a place that would influence some men who would arrive in perfect timing to fulfill the fullness of prophecy that he had made. Hey, Consider that. And why is Matthew the only book that presents it? Well, if you were here when we begin our study of Matthew, Matthew is the gospel of what? The king. Matthew is the gospel of the king, presented from a uniquely Jewish perspective, walking through genealogies uniquely and specific to those things, walking through accounts like the Magi coming to crown him king because they were the king makers. It was everything specifically and perfectly accomplished promised, proven, and carried out. You know, in our generation, we celebrate Christmas, don't we? I mean, Christmas is a time of celebration. I don't even want to know. I heard this year that Halloween passed the one billion mark in, in sales and other things. It's now become an economy unto itself. I can't even begin to imagine what Christmas is. We celebrate Christmas, don't we? We celebrate it in some form or fashion. We recognize it around this world. It's known. I went to Africa and they knew what Christmas was. There was no lack of a celebration of Christmas. There's Christmas cards. There's nativity sets. There are wise men and songs and carols. And even on the secular radio, they're singing Christmas songs and celebrating Christmas. But you recognize, I hope, that in all of that, they miss the point. They miss it. We don't miss it. We know the meaning. They don't see who He is. But there are some who do. It's a joy to be gathered with you this morning to teach these truths because of the freedom it gives you as a child of His. To confront you if you're not a child of His and recognizing the freedom you can have in Him. That our Lord came to this earth to ransom, to seek and save that which was lost. To give us a hope and a promise that we can be those even in the face of our greatest enemy, death. That we can even in the face of that grieve our loss, but not as those without hope. 1 Thessalonians 5. That we know that our king who was born in a manger is a king who upon his death went into the belly of death and defeated it once for all, removing that as our enemy. That we can live in hope in the life that we face, even in the greatest enemy, which is universally faced by all of this world. Isn't that exciting? And here we have amazing further confirmation. The story of the Magi. There's, there's three guys who brought strange gifts. That in that account that we grew up hearing in VBS and seeing on cards, that there's amazing confirmation and provenness of the 
sovereign rule and control of our God that allows us to stand on the character and promises of our God even when things seem so uncertain in the present. They are not uncertain. We have an example for our souls and what do we now do with this? I love this picture. Another part of the purpose and point of Matthew 2 is that we might see an example of proper worship of Jesus. It's recorded how these men came and set an example. One of the first things I would see in their example is that true worship of the true king is accurate. That's a strange word. We don't really sing songs about the accuracy of Christ or the accuracy of our worship. We don't really rejoice in that very much. And yet, I want you to understand that a true believer, this is of greatest importance. For all of the world, it's of greatest importance that you worship accurately. You know, in our world today, again, we celebrate Christmas. But the problem is, we live in a time when accurate worship is so utterly despised. It's looked down upon. You start talking in terms of accuracy and singularity and what does it really say, and suddenly you get to a place where people start talking in terms of, that's, that's too much for me. I just want to worship Him the way that I feel is best for me. I just want to do it my way. I just want, when I think of Jesus, I want to think in terms of how I want to think of Jesus. And yet what we have as an example here is the wise men or the, the magi coming and they were worshiping in accuracy and with great clarity. They knew. They knew who he was. They recognized it. They had been awaiting it. Let's, let's consider some ways that, that we struggle with accuracy and clarity in our worship today. Sometimes, oftentimes, we rob from accuracy, clarity, and truth by being incomplete. We like to have an incomplete God because it feeds our flesh so well. One of the examples we just looked at is God's sovereignty. It's a struggle for us to believe that God is sovereign. It's a struggle for this world to believe that. And there's so much worship of God that's a denial of His sovereignty. And we see it play out in a multitude of ways. So many times we see within the, the manner of, of prayer... How we pray to the Lord. That we pray in such a way that we fully expect Him to carry out His, what, His omnipotence, His, His limitless power on behalf of Almighty me and my wisdom and desires. That's not a worship of God. That's a worship of me. And when He doesn't answer or respond in the way I desire, I get mad. How dare you, God, not employ your power on behalf of Almighty me? Now, we wouldn't say it that way, but is that not where we end up? How many times have you heard from people that they've just walked away from, from worshiping God? They wouldn't maybe say they walked away from the faith, or maybe they would, but they'd say, well, I don't go to church anymore. I don't, I don't believe the promises of God to the point of obedience to the commands of God because God let me down. Right? How many times have you shared the gospel with someone where they say to you, as Einstein said, I believe in a higher power. I can't look at this world and not know that there's something greater than man. However, I cannot believe in the God of the Bible because there's so much brokenness. Well, God explained that. Genesis chapter 3 is ground zero for every malady we face. When we walk through that, you understand it because you walk through the fullness of it. When you just show up for Christmas or read it on a card, you don't know these truths. And we miss it. We, we worship in incompleteness. We, we attempt to worship in incompleteness. How, how about this one? Jesus is love. Amen. Amen. But is that all he is? See, what the problem is, is when we, when we worship only the love of Jesus, it, we come to a place, and this is so common, where within the church today, it's this idea, let's worship that trait. And let's forget that he's also truth. And truth is narrow by its very definition. I always say, and it's a simplistic answer, but it's one to think through. Two plus two equals four. It doesn't equal five, and it doesn't equal three. Two plus two equals four. And we can't meet somewhere in the middle at 3.5. It equals four. And if you're a teacher here, you know that. Your student turns in a paper that says two plus two equals something other than four, they get it wrong. How narrow-minded can you be? 
Yet this is the reality of what Scripture gives us. There is a truth that's been given to us, it's been proven for us, and we are those who by faith trust the truth we've been given. Our Lord is truth and love. More than that, He's justice and judgment. He's been given the hands of judgment. We see that picture. He will carry that out. He's been given the hand of justice. One of the things that we long for in the return of Christ is that he will reestablish justice to this world for a short season. And that ultimately we will experience the fullness of his perfection in every arena eternally with him. We're lacking that in our worship today. It's subtle, but it's inaccurate. If we worship Jesus but it's only a portion of Jesus. I want you to understand, it's not Jesus. It's incomplete. It has not the power of salvation. If you want to only focus on one character of Jesus and make that the point of all that you are, it's not Jesus. You've missed the point. It's subtle, but it's so dangerous. Think about this. When the wise men came, I believe they were respectful to Mary and Joseph. I, I do. I'm sure that they were very respectful to the parents of the king. But they didn't worship them. They knew who they were there to worship. They didn't confuse it. They didn't somehow get to a place where they thought, Oh, blessed woman, are you Mary? Let us worship both. They were very specific and accurate in their understanding and carrying out of the worship they brought to King Jesus and Him alone. You have to recognize the accuracy that's being displayed here. Think about this. If you only focus on one character, if you have an incomplete, it could be accurate. Jesus is love. Amen. But he is more than that. And in that, if we, if we only focus, imagine the, the difficulty we would have with the gospel. Think about this for just a moment. Picture, picture what the gospel does. The gospel, as we've studied and we recognize, it brings us to a point of conviction. It brings us to a point of conviction as sinners. And in that conviction, it gives us grace as a means of coming out from underneath of that conviction. But if you don't have conviction, you'll never recognize grace. It would be this picture. Imagine if someone came up to you and offered grace for something you didn't do. Right? Hey, I, I just want you to know I'm going to forgive you for wrecking my car last week. And you're like, I didn't wreck your car. You don't, you don't need to offer me any grace there. You don't, you, I don't need forgiveness. I didn't do that. Right? If you don't have a point of conviction and recognition of your sinful condition because of the fullness of the character of who Jesus is, then it would be like trying to offer someone grace that didn't need it. It won't function. Or how about this one? Being shown mercy by someone who's not a judge. Right? I can't go into our jail system, walk up and down and say into the cell blocks that are there, I am so merciful, let me go ahead and let you out. I don't have that authority, that capability, that power. They would look at me and say, well, that's a nice thought. Thanks a lot for nothing. Because I don't have that. You have to understand that if you only see Christ as love, and you don't see him in the area of justice and judgment, there's no place of mercy and grace in your life. You have to have the fullness. When we don't worship with accuracy, we are robbed of Jesus and what he's brought. How about this one? You just have to believe in Jesus to receive all the benefits, but actually trusting and submitting to him is something that's, that's avoided at all costs because you know what? People will reject that. If I can believe in Jesus and receive all the benefits, if I can profess Jesus and receive all the benefits, I'm all in. I don't want to go to hell just in case it is real. I mean, what do I got to do? Sign on the dotted line, I can do that. Oh, wait a second. He's going to interfere in my life and affect how I live? He's going to begin to show himself in every arena of my thought patterns and the lifestyle I live? Wait a second. That will and often is, and we're told it will be, is rejected. But it is the truth, and it is accurate to recognize it. Only he is king. Only he was deserving of their worship. The second thing that we see in the visit of the Magi is that their worship of Jesus, the example he's, they set, 
is that it's costly. Luke 14, Jesus tells the crowds, count the cost. Count the cost because following me comes with a cost. It, my burden is easy and my yoke is light, but there is a burden and there is a yoke. It, it's obedience to him. It's living in light of our citizenship, which is bound up in heaven. It's evidenced by the deeds we carry out because faith without any deeds to give evidence to it is demonic faith, James says. The demons believe in Jesus. They even shuddered. But they had no salvation through that belief. And so there's this recognition that there's a cost through or to the worship. But think about the wise, the, the magi. They traveled from afar in the face of opposition. Not only the natural opposition, it wasn't easy to travel back then, you know. They, they didn't have Uber. They didn't even have anything other than whatever horse or camel. Likely they were riding horses. Even though camels were the common method of transportation, these men were known to ride the steeds of Persia. It's one of the interesting facts about who they were. We don't know that they were riding that because it's in there, but they traveled by horseback in the face of great danger physically in multiple ways. It was not a nice and forgiving environment, either from the human opposition of robbers and thieves and others, or also from the just natural environment. It's not a nice place to travel in many ways. And so it was costly. They traveled from afar in the face of opposition to worship Jesus. We, we have a hard time getting people to travel outside of their door and walk up the block to worship Jesus on a given Sunday. And these men traveled from afar in the face of great opposition. In other words, they recognized the value of the worship of the Messiah. It meant much to them. The gifts they brought gave evidence to that. And what we need to understand is that the gospel always affects us in this way. Where the value of things that is temporal or temporal are overcome by the value of that which is eternal. He whom we are worshiping. Our worship should be truly unreserved unreserved not just in our singing you do realize that we worship in multiple ways other than singing that, that singing is not the only means of worship but there are multiple ways in which we worship in Matthew 13 the shortest parable that Christ gave we have this account about the kingdom of heaven that displays this truth about what it means to be one who is a worshiper of Jesus in verse 44 it says the kingdom of heaven it was like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found, and he hid again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, re let me reiterate this point. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. You see, the reality of what it means to worship Jesus is that there is a cost. It's not just proclaimed, it's evidenced. He himself being our example that we might follow in his steps. We're told that if we profess to be in him, we ought to walk as he walked. And we have the account of his life and where it led in all arenas. We have the account of his disciples and where it led in all arenas. We have church history that shows us what happens when you live as a citizen of another world or another kingdom. That you live in light of that life. So many times, there, there's such a popular saying today about having your best life now. It's not a good thing, y'all. It is not good to have your best life now because if there is another life and we believe that there is, you don't want this temporary momentary one to be your best one. You want that eternal one that's coming to be your best one. And so this picture that we're given in scripture is always that. And that's what we see here. You see, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that a man finds and gives everything he has with joy for the acquisition of that. Is that what the gospel has done in your life? It, when you look at the gospel, when you look at the account of Christ's birth and life and death and resurrection, his promises and provision for all that we have, is it affecting you or has it affected you even in that way? Or was it something that you, you brought in as fire insurance or some other means of fulfilling you and what you desire? The gospel in every 
scenario presented in Scripture comes with a cost. I love the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says that we've replaced the cost of grace and made it cheap. He was speaking in the terms of his generation, but we have not gotten better for sure. Cheap grace. There is no such thing. Free grace, yes, but it came with great cost. You know the account. You know we're celebrating the birth, but the birth isn't the full point. The birth is the beginning, but it goes forth through a life that is lived culminating in a horrific death and in a taking on the wrath of the Father on behalf of all sinners who would know him and trust him. You see, there's a great cost to grace. Our Lord paid that cost, but don't we dare cheapen the cost of grace. And in that, this picture of the wise men, of the magi, the magi, their gifts display this. Gold, right? We all know that gold is valuable. We all know that gold is valuable. I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but let's just think in terms of the logical economy of things. They traveled a great distance in the face of opposition and through great struggle with joy to worship the Messiah. They did so bringing that which is of great value. Gold, historically, and it's universally recognized, it's often reserved for royalty. Hey, recognizing these things, they, they brought that which they didn't hold back. They didn't say, well, we didn't want to tap the gold reserve, so we brought you some minted silver. They brought that which was valuable in their worship. Frankincense. You know, it's interesting. Frankincense. I, I grew up hearing about this. And so just recently, uh, I googled it just to see a few things. I'd studied it in the past, so it's not something new. But what was new is when I googled it recently, you can buy it at Walmart. Frankincense has become, if you're part of the essential oils movement of our generation, frankincense is a big part of your life. I had no idea. I had no idea that frankincense was such a common thing today. Now, it's still valuable. It still costs money in its purest form. It, it is not cheap to have. But frankincense is something that's recognized. But it is an expensive incense in this time that was used only for the most special of occasions, oftentimes at a time of burial. Oftentimes it was part of the burial ritual. It only grows or specifically grew in, in a region that we know as Oman. And in that region it was very difficult to attain only during a specific season. You had to harvest it through the sap of a tree. And in this frankincense, it was, it was very expensive, very costly to get. And in other words, it might be a part of someone's inheritance that was used to purchase it for the burial of the person. And we know, if you know of Nero, as Nick has taught through First Peter and walked through what Nero brought to bear on Christianity, one thing I didn't know is that his favorite mistress upon her death, he burned a year's supply of frankincense, symbolic of the worth that he attributed to her. Frankincense was only used for the most special of occasions. It was valuable and not to be taken lightly in any sense. Origen, one of the great church fathers, suggested that frankincense was the incense of deity. In the Old Testament, it was stored in a special chamber in front of the temple and was sprinkled on certain offerings as a symbol of the people's desire to be pleasing unto the Lord. Frankincense was significant. It wasn't just what they picked up on the local fair or marketplace on the way through town. Uh-oh, we're getting close. We better, we better grab something we don't want to show up empty-handed. No, they came prepared in accurate and costly worship. Myrrh. This was another perfume. It wasn't as costly as frankincense in that time, but it was used again often in preparation of the dead for burial. There was a whole spice preparation, uh, meaning they took many herbs and other things in the preparation. The perfumes that were used were difficult to attain. You didn't just run to Walgreens. They didn't have special places as you traveled that had duty-free buy this perfume. They had to go and prepare and spend, and, and, and it was costly for them. You see, what we need to take from this, the Christmas story is so much more than a scene on a card. What a glorious and yet scandalous scene we have. We have a teenage mother, a baby conceived out of wedlock, a group of Gentile magicians, all being drawn in and together by God's eternal plan and the beauty of the gospel that is what came to this world 
and the birth of our Messiah. That this is a picture of the worshiping and living this out and recognizing this in the face of great peril and consequence. What a foundation for us to stand on in our faith with whatever we're facing. With whatever struggles we have. What a, what a conviction for us to be accurate at Christmas. To, to be those who, who are accurate in our worship, in our practices, in our views of the things that God has given us. Brothers and sisters, as we begin to prepare our minds for the realities of what is a Christian's view of Christmas, we need to know it's one that is established by and in Scripture. It is okay to enjoy traditions and celebrations in this world. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to be those who never let those overshadow the true reason for the songs that we sing, for the season that we recognize, for the times that we gather. The essence of what we see in Matthew 2, 1 to 12 is so much more than what the world has made it out to be. And I hope that this beginning introduction to the Christmas story from the perspective of those who were there in one degree or another has given you fresh insight and renewed your excitement, your commitment, your recognition, your understanding of what Christmas really means. Would you pray with me this morning as we prepare to worship in song? Lord, I thank you for the advent that you bring forth in your Son. Lord, that we can look back upon that and see the fullness of all of your promises. Lord, that because of who you are, displayed and proven continually, not only on the pages of Scripture, but if we're a child of yours, then proven in our own lives. Paul recognized and, and, and was not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel had saved his very soul and made him a new creation. Lord, it was because of his experience and confrontation with the gospel that he knew what he knew and lived as he lived. Lord, let us who have had that confrontation and that surrender Lord, let us be those who, who worship in accuracy and truth, counting the cost and considering you worthy of it this Christmas season. And Lord, for those who are here today who, who don't know you beyond the baby in a manger and the Christmas card account, Lord, who have heard of you maybe all of their lives, but they have never known you as the one who has confronted their condition and save them from it. Lord, I pray that even today, that you would open their hearts. That through whatever they're facing, that they would recognize the futility and frustration that the things of this world bring us. That it's difficult to even worship in a secular sense, or to celebrate in a secular sense Christmas, because it is so oriented to consumerism. Lord, I pray that we would be those who take a step back. And Lord, I pray that those who are here who don't know what that step back is, Lord, that you would open their hearts that they might know you. Lord, that they would receive and surrender, submitting themselves to the cost of the gospel and the fullness of the grace of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would do these things as you have brought your son to accomplish them into the world many years ago. Lord, we thank you for this season that we can recognize and worship you in the fullness of your gift, the gift of your son. We ask this in, your, in his name. Amen.